you here. 85 degrees in the shade. Oh, don't remind me, Tech. It's just way too hot for a day in May. Too hot for us means it's too hot for customers, fellas. What say we take our minds off the heat by talking about a cool subject? Like air conditioning service. Good idea, Roy. There's a lot that's new. Moving the unit under the hood made more luggage compartment space available and improved cold air distribution. But a new location sometimes brings up different service problems. Yeah, Tech, it's like moving the refrigerator next to the stove. That engine compartment heats up like a furnace room, especially in city traffic during hot weather. So hot air leaks into the air circulation part of the air conditioning system have a serious effect on its efficiency. Now that blower, remember, acts a lot like a vacuum cleaner. So just a small leak on the suction side of the blower can raise the temperature of the air entering the car enough to make a noticeable difference in cooling. You mean the refrigeration part could be 100% okay, but hot air leaks can make owners unhappy. Right, Carl. That's one thing we have to check out very carefully. Another point to keep in mind is that under some operating conditions, the evaporator cools the air to about 32 degrees. So on high humidity days, a lot of water is condensed out of the conditioned air. That's a good feature. However, a good dehumidifying job means a lot of condensation to get rid of. So all drains must work properly so water can get out and still keep hot engine air from coming in. I see. Now how should I go about checking a unit that might come in for attention? Before you start testing, you've got to get the engine compartment as hot as it would be under normal conditions. Tech's right. So we'll run the engine and air conditioning system 20 minutes or more to duplicate hot weather driving conditions. While the engine and unit are running, we'll check the controls to see if they're doing what they're supposed to do. Now, if they're working okay, we'll make sure the evaporator is getting cold enough to provide proper cooling. We do this by using a new test to check the point at which the thermal switch cycles the compressor clutch. Finally, we'll make an overall performance test to find out if the air delivered inside is as cold as it should be. Okay, Roy. Should I connect the manifold gauge set first? Yeah. And both gauges should show pressure, Carl, even when the system isn't operating. Now, if they don't, it's because there's a leak somewhere. So you'd locate and correct the leak before going any farther. Connect a test light across the fuller element circuit. You can use a short length of heavy copper wire as an adapter for this parallel test light connection. But be mighty careful, Carl. Make sure you don't ground the adapter or zingo. You'll burn out one of the micro switches in the temperature control unit. In fact, play it safe and make sure the ignition is off before you open any of the circuits leading to the micro switches. Just be sure you don't ground any of the wires in the control circuit. Okay, I'll watch out for that. We want to run the engine at 1200 RPM with a compressor clutch and gauge. So connect the tachometer. Then start the engine and adjust the engine speed to 1200. Good. Now move the temperature control lever to off and flip the selector switch to cooling. Now, with the controls in these positions, the clutch should disengage and the recirculating door should open. The test light should not light. Then move the temperature control to cold. The compressor clutch should engage. The recirculating door should remain open. And you'll notice the test light glowing dimly because not much current flows to the fuller element. Be sure the water flow valve lever stays in the fully closed position against the stop and with its return spring loose. Looks tightly closed to me. Fine. Now slowly move the temperature control lever from cold to the warmest position and watch the test light. The light should burn gradually brighter. The recirculating door should close and the clutch remain engaged. Now put your finger on the fuller element to feel if it's getting hot. Feel the capillary around the element, Carl, not just the cover. That's a good point, Tech. Now check the blower to see that it operates on all three speeds, Carl. Next, check the distribution duct damper control to see that it works properly. It directs the airflow down to the lower outlets or up to the defroster outlets. Let's knock on wood, Roy. Everything seems to be working okay so far. 
That gives our air conditioning controls a clean bill of health, Carl. Now, if we had trouble, we'd refer to the reference book for a more detailed diagnosis of the control circuits. Okay, Roy. What's next? Refrigeration checks, Carl. Set the air control on up, the blower on low, the temperature control on cold, and the selector switch on cooling, and close the windows up tight. Make sure the sight glass is clear, my boy. Any bubbles calls for adding refrigerant. Sight glass is clear. Our engine's still running at 1,200, and the compressor clutch is engaged. Good. Look the condenser fins over next. They've got to be free of bugs or dirt, because they can cut down the flow of air through the condenser. I've brushed off the last bug, Roy. Fine. Now close the hood so the heat will be confined to the engine compartment. See that the front of the car is away from a wall, so the airflow to the radiator grill will be unrestricted. Now, suction pressure on the left-hand gauge should go down to 10 to 20 pounds before the thermal switch opens the circuit to disengage the compressor clutch. When the clutch disengages, suction pressure will go back up to about 35 pounds. In a few minutes, the evaporator will start to warm up. And when this happens, the thermal switch will automatically close the circuit to the magnetic clutch. The clutch will then engage, and suction pressure will gradually decrease. Let the thermal switch cycle a clutch several times until you're sure the clutch always disengages when suction pressure is in the 10 to 20 pound range. That's how you'll know the evaporator gets cold enough and refrigeration is okay. This unit passes that refrigeration check with flying colors, all right. But suppose suction pressure was higher than 20 or lower than 10 when the thermal switch opened the clutch circuit. Where would you look for trouble? Well, that might mean a faulty thermal switch or moisture in the system. You'd have to stop your test and refer to the reference book for details on how to correct these conditions. I see. It tells right here how to locate and correct those troubles. Swell. You won't find it hard to figure out the fix, Carl. Tech's right. But now let's get set for a performance test to see if the air delivered inside is as cold as it ought to be. We've run the engine and system long enough to duplicate driving and traffic at about 25 miles an hour. Very true, Roy. But somebody please turn the record over first so we can spell out details on this next test. Here's how to set the controls for the performance test. Put the selector switch on cooling and move the temperature control lever about three-eighths of an inch to the right of cold. In addition, see that the recirculating door is closed, the test light dim, and the water valve closed. Direct all air up. Set the blower on high, then suspend a thermometer in one of the open outlet grills, facing it so you can read temperature from outside the car. Yeah, Carl. Then put a second thermometer near the center of the cowl vent. Rest it across a pencil to keep the bulb from touching the grill metal. Once more, close the car doors and windows. Also see that engine speed is still 1,200 RPM when the compressor clutch is engaged. All right. Is there anything else? Yep. You take a third thermometer and bandage the bulb with five or six layers of cotton gauze, tied so it won't slip off. This is for wet bulb readings. Tie a two-foot piece of twine to the upper end. Wet the bandage in water at room temperature. And then using the string as a sling, swing the thermometer for several minutes to speed up evaporation at the bulb. Check the reading quickly when you stop. Rewet the bandage and swing the thermometer again until you've cooled it as much as you can by evaporation. Now tell me the lowest temperature you get and I'll make a note of it. 62 degrees is the lowest wet bulb reading I get, Roy. Okay. Now, what's the cowl vent thermometer show, Tech? 88 degrees, Roy. Good. Now we'll look at the chart. 88 degrees inlet temperature, 62 wet bulb temperature. Now, let's see where those two columns meet. It looks like 53 degrees is the maximum temperature we should have for air delivered inside the car. Now, what's the outlet thermometer say, Tech? Uh-oh. Our outlet temperature is 56 degrees, Roy. That's three degrees warmer than it ought to be. Not quite good enough, huh? Nope, it's not quite up to standard. So let's review what we've checked so far. We know our controls are okay. 
the thermal switch cycles the clutch properly and our evaporator gets cold enough. So the only thing we haven't done is to check for hot air leaks on the suction side of the blower. Might as well shut off the engine, Carl. It's as hot as a four-alarm fire, so you better drop it down to idle speed for a few minutes first, or it might continue to run. Good point, Tech. Can you spot those leaks by looking it over? Not too easily, Carl. But you can seal up all the places you think air might leak in. Roy can give you the details. First, we'll check both plenum chamber drains to make sure they fit tightly against the dash panel. Also, they should be closed to prevent air from coming in. One-way water valves, in other words. Check the evaporator drain tube next. It attaches to a nylon connector that must make a good seal at the housing. Now, at the blower, check the blower to housing connector and tape it up if necessary. Better seal around the blower motor and between the motor mounting and blower housing. That's right, Tech. Those are points you wouldn't normally suspect of leaking, but you don't want to overlook them. Another thing, check the grommet and seal at the refrigerant line opening. Also check the grommet at the heater inlet tube. Seal around there with body sealer too if needed. Then check to make sure the evaporator and housing seal well against the dash panel. If any of the bolts are loose, tighten them to 30 inch pounds. But take it easy, Carl. For instance, always tighten the housing bolts in sequence from the center outward like you'd handle the bolts on a cylinder head. If you tighten them more than 30 inch pounds or pull one down while the others are loose, you'll probably crack the housing. Okay, fellas. I'll watch it. Fine. Now seal around the entire housing with body sealer. And while you're at it, seal the thermometer hole plug. There. Now that covers all the most obvious points where leakage could occur. Let's run another performance test and see if we've licked the trouble. Okay, Roy. You get the dry bulb thermometers in place, and I'll get a new wet bulb reading. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get out of the way while Carl swings that thermometer. He'd like to give me a shower. I can just see it coming. Oh, now, Tech, you know I wouldn't do that to you, unless I got a good chance. Yeah, I know. Just keep your mind on your business, kid. Get on with the temperature taking. All set, Carl? Our inlet temperature is 87 now. What's your wet bulb reading? I read 61, Roy. Okay, let's see what the chart says. Mm-hmm. 53 degrees. And that's what we had before. Hey, that's good. The outlet thermometer is reading 51 now. Well, that's a little better than good. Fine. We must have sealed up the leaks that were causing the trouble. I'd say the owner of this car is going to be very happy now. Hooray for our side. But Roy, suppose we had a job with a greater difference in temperature and we hadn't licked the trouble with the sealing work we did. Then what? Well, it's possible that there may be some air leaks you can't correct simply by sealing on the outside like we did this one. Then you'd have to remove the blower and the housing. I can show you on the bench over here what you might run into. First of all, make sure there are no cracks in the housing flange. Then see that all the insulation is in place. With all that engine compartment heat, good insulation is mighty important. Right. And then be sure the grommets for the heater and evaporator lines are made of sponge rubber. If you find hard rubber grommets, replace them with the new sponge rubber grommets. How do you install them? That's a good question. You install them on the heater and evaporator lines before you install the housing. There's one point to watch, however. The evaporator line grommet is installed above the evaporator line mounting clamp. Use a sponge rubber gasket on the housing flange too, Carl. Shall I scrape off the old composition gasket? No, cement the sponge rubber gasket right on top of the old one. Cut out a short piece of the gasket at each grommet opening to make room for the grommets you installed on the heater and evaporator lines. Stick the mounting bolts through the holes in the flange and gasket, Carl. They'll hold the gasket in place while the cement dries. A good tip, Tech. Uh, how about that evaporator drain, Roy? Yeah. Be sure that drain is in place. If you don't find one in there, use a rubber plug, like the one in the rear face of the door, to plug the hole. You don't actually need a drain there anyway, but you must plug the hole. Now, 
use sealing compound to build a dam across the bottom of the evaporator case. That's to keep air from sneaking in between the fins and the case. Leave about a two inch opening so water can flow out to the other evaporator drain. Well, that's about it. You'll find a few more details in the reference book, but those are the main points. Yep, I think you covered it pretty thoroughly, Roy. And as for you fellas out there, just remember, we should always do an extra special job in air conditioning service. When you do it right, it will be a wonderful reminder to the owner that Master Tech Service is tops.